everybody very knowledgeable, and we're just so glad to have him to talk about Edgewood Park. He um, he leads the restoration work days at Edgewood Park, which is a, a great learning experience and a great help to um, Edgewood. So um, I'll let Ken get started because I don't want to take much of his time now. Well. And so I'm sorry I didn't give you a little warning. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you, Chris, uh, for the nice introduction. And as mentioned, I'm Ken Himes, and I live in nearby uh, Belmont. And if the GPS is correct, I'm at about seven feet elevation. And it's very level. And Chris also mentioned we have uh, plant sales, two a year, one in October, and one in April. And everyone will agree that the best time to plant native plants is with the beginning of the fall rains. And I've been amiss because I bought this plant. And this is a small manzanita. It's the Pajaro manzanita. And this is a selection by Roger Raish, who was at the uh, Botanical Garden at UC Berkeley, honoring Merle Wolf, a longtime member of the Bay Chapter of the Native Plant Society. Well, I should have planted this the course in November. But what have I been doing? Totally level. I've been mounding my backyard. In other words, to create a slope. So plants for sunny slopes. Uh, we're going to look at habitats uh, locally. For example, Edgewood County Park. Uh, San Bruno Mountain, Sweeney Ridge, these are all open space areas where we can see these plants and we can get ideas. In addition, I uh, look through plants from our chaparral areas. There's a lot of great ones. In fact, this plant comes from near Aromas in uh, Monterey County, very close to Highway 101 and the Pajaro River, which forms the boundary between uh, Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, and Santa Clara County. Gee, an excellent little specimen. So it grows in uh, inland sand deposits. Sometimes this is known because it's very similar to a scrub we have in our area as Maritime Chaparral, the community. And we'll see in the slideshow uh, photographs of these various communities. But I want to start off the slideshow. Get it going. With a shot that, uh, let's see, whoops, I better move the manzanita. I need a detail. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this shot may have been San Carlos, uh, at least the area like where I live, at relatively uh, level in elevation 200 years ago. In 1794, George Vancouver, uh, with the Hudson Bay Company, an English uh, trading concern, traveled through this area. And he mentions Belmont Hill, the hill to the north of here, uh, south of Ralston, and a fine stream, Belmont Creek. He also mentions that within a mile, they entered this uh, park-like woodland with English oaks. Well, the oak he was seeing reminded him of the European English white oak. These, as we now know, are valley oaks. Uh, sometimes also known as California white oaks. And if uh, sometimes I go to Edgewood uh, Park and Preserve by taking St. Francis, and there's still very noble specimens uh, along St. Francis. Of course, what we lack is the associated habitat. <clears throat> One thing uh, Vancouver mentioned was the absence of understory plants, or at least woody plants, plants we might utilize for the framework of our landscape. And as we see in this shot, in Kern County, Lynn's Valley, near the little hamlet of uh, Glenville, in the Greenhorn Range, the flora associated with the valley oaks is dominated by herbaceous 
or non-woody plants, primarily annuals, plants that complete their lifespan in a single year. What we see is just the beginning of spring occurring with uh, white flowers in uh, masses, popcorn flower. So this uh, may be reminiscent of areas in San Carlos, but San Carlos, well, to mine, I do have a shot. I want to show you western San Carlos. It's more like this. It's a slope. Now this was a cloudy day in October at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden in Tilden, which is above Berkeley. And uh, if you want to find the wealth of information, visit your botanic gardens any time of the year. As you can see the little markers, plants are labeled. You can see them in a variety of either geographical associations or community. Uh, they're not actually used as a landscape plant in this botanic garden, but other botanic gardens, uh, like Striving in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, or the uh, UC Botanical Garden in Strawberry Canyon, just east of Memorial Stadium, Stadium do have landscape settings. But nevertheless, uh, if we join that group, uh, there's just a wealth of plant material for sunny slopes. Shady slopes too. So if we were in southwest San Carlos, right at the border off Crestview, we, looking to the south and southwest, we might see this scene. We can look over the uh, shrub dominated uh, plant community of Upper Polgus Ridge Open Space Preserve, just southwest of San Carlos, towards Edgewood County Park and Preserve in western Redwood City. This is the uh, Cordilleras Creek watershed and it's very interesting ge geologically and the vegetation type expresses the substrate, in other words the type of soil in an area, but in addition also it reflects the topography. Does the slope face south or southwest? which gets the full brunt of the solar radiation, the sun's rays. Or is it a north-facing slope, like the central ridge at Edgewood, which is heavily wooded, that stays much moister uh, during our winter and into spring, and actually even supports a tree, the state tree of Oregon, Douglas fir. As uh, Chris mentioned, we're going to have uh, a walk through shrub-based uh, communities at Edgewood. We'll see coastal scrub, and we'll also see, uh, like here along the Clarkey Trail, the serpentine chaparral with early uh, flowering geophytes. These are uh, plants, perennials generally. Many of them are bulbs that will go dormant. This is star lily. Uh, this is a scene we may see Saturday. I haven't pre-hyped it, but depending on our climatic uh, temperature, we may very well see this. In addition, a number of good shrub species that can be used in our lo local landscapes. Now, I mentioned also coastal scrub. Well, right here on the peninsula, we're kind of in a broad climatic gradient. And primarily, that low saddle is where Highway 92 uh, heads west to uh, Half Moon Bay, the low saddle on the horizon. Now it's generally dominated by a, a shrub dominated community called coastal scrub. The uh, large groups of trees are actually plantations planted by the San Francisco Water Department, uh, Monterey Pine and Monterey Cypress, theoretically to enhance water collection for the Crystal Springs watershed. But actually, shrub-dominated communities uh, are through that low divide in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It allows a lot of marine influence, fog, wind, cloudy days into our area. In the foreground, this is the northern extension of Polgus Ridge on the San Francisco watershed, and it's dominated by herbaceous plants, non-woody plants, that may have been associated with the white oaks. Uh, 
There's an outcrop of serpentine. Generally, serpentine in our area excludes trees, mainly because of shallow soils and poor moisture holding uh, abilities. So to point out uh, the topography in our local area, Highway 92 in the Gap is a break in the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. But also at the north end of the San Francisco Peninsula, the northwest winds are very strong, uh, which you know is responsible for uh, pushing the California current along our coast, as well as the upwelling, which uh, leads to uh, the cool temperatures off our coast and the formation of coastal stratus, and it affects the western end of San Bruno Mountain, the whole western Sweeney Ridge, part of the GGNRA, the uh, National Park System. Also, the whole San Francisco watershed. And we get uh, part of that, too, along our high western ridges in the vicinity of San Carlos and Belmont. As you get towards Redwood City, you uh, lose that effect. <coughs> so just to mention, uh, natural occurrence, uh, a shrub that's found in the coastal scrub, very common on San Bruno Mountain, blooms in the middle of summer. A member of the aster family is called lizard's tail. Two feet high, mounding, could be a very good addition to our gardens. It did occur at Edgewood in 1996, but it's much warmer and drier at Edgewood. Uh, this is the central ridge on the south side with true chaparral in the background. The coffee berry that it was underneath died. And within one year, the lizard tail died. It's my feeling that it's just too hot and dry, just extending four miles south of the Half Moon Bay Gap for this plant to survive in full sun. As long as it had cover, it was okay. Another example, at Edgewood County Park, we have sticky monkey flower with its uh, it flowers extraordinarily uh, floriferous at Edgewood. Also, at San Bruno Mountain, uh, Montero Mountain, the big difference is in spring, it is a great feature at Edgewood. Summer, the plants are almost leafless and entirely burnt out. If you go to the coast, at San Pedro Valley County Park near Pacifica, it's still flowering. It's still flowering at uh, San Bruno Mountain, even into September. Now, we as gardeners control the environmental conditions much uh, more than nature does. We may consider adding, you know, uh, monthly watering to keep the plant turgid and green. We also may trim it for a second flowering in September. You know, we have different means to make some of these plants quite attractive that may not be in our uh, warmer summers this far south in the peninsula. By the time you get to uh, Palo Alto, this is along Upper Page Mill Road, you're in full-blown chaparral, a, a plant community adapted to very hot, arid conditions. We can see it in flower here. Chemise, a member of the rose family that is dominant, probably the most dominant and abundant plant of the chaparral in California. Actually, it's responsible for giving chaparral uh, a bad name, too. More about that later. <laughs> Interestingly, just on a slightly different aspect, a little different angle, there's a big colony of monkey flower within the chemise chaparral. Also, oaks and the swales. So moisture and moisture gradients determine everything as far as natural distribution of uh, native plants in their natural state. Substrate, soils in our area. We live close to the San Andreas Rift Zone. In fact, it's just west and southwest of us. In fact, here it is, uh, 280s, very close. And um, the yellows, browns, pans are recent sediments deposited. When I mean recent, 
within you know the last 500,000 years, and they haven't consolidated to get to form rocks, uh, sedimentary rocks. These are gravels, the Santa Clara Formation, and uh, fine loams to uh, heavy clays, especially when you get into the sloughs, the, the uh, very slow-moving sloughs where the clays settle out. I actually live right here, so I do have, at depth, some of that bay clay. That is just what natives from sunny slopes do not want. <laughs> boy, oh boy. They want drainage at the crown where the stem joins the root system. It's almost imperative. So if you have a sunny slope, uh, you are indeed fortunate because you achieve that just by being on the angle. I might mention uh, our region, Polgus Ridge and Edgewood is particularly diverse and that's one reason I chose it for a field trip is to see some of the uh, different communities that occur on different soil groups. So we not only have to photography, but the geology. The central ridge is greenstone and altered basalt. We've got a big mass of serpentine. We'll walk through that on the Clarkia Trail. Also, uh, let's see, gray wacky, a sandstone. We'll hit a part of it and see coastal. Uh, different species, there's many as 60 in the state, uh, come from small trees to medium-sized shrubs, like uh, the pajaro manzanita, to ground covers. But I haven't always had success. Being a neophyte at one time, I uh, planted this plant, a chaparral-derived plant, woolly blue curls, in a slight swale that collected water. Well. It got a fungal root disease and within a year died. So you do learn by your mistakes. And this was case in point. I should have hurried up and proceeded down to Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden in Claremont in Southern California and come up with an idea like this. A dry stream with a meadow foam that if it does collect water moisture, is tolerant of uh, saturated conditions. In fact, this meadow foam is actually uh, found naturally only on the Point Reyes headlands. It's a form of the uh, Douglas meadow foam called variety sulfuria, and it's pure yellow, where most me meadow foams are whitish. Notice the iris, uh, wonderful things we can do. And then, another death in my garden. But this wasn't uh, intentional by me. I had a very small plant, and we may be able to see it emerging at Edgewood. And I'll definitely show you the habitat. The uh, narrow leaf milkweed. I planted it out in, um, oh, well, I was correct, in November. It started to get established, started to leaf out, and then, well, I get busy at Edgewood and elsewhere, wasn't really paying attention. Then the monarch butterfly lava, the caterpillar, was crawling across my driveway. I go, what's it doing here? Well, it's the milkweeds that are the host plants for the uh, monarch butterfly, various species. Well, this one was so young and not established that they literally defoliated it, and it died. Meanwhile, I hope they uh, completed their lifespan. <laughs> <laughs> because with native plants, hopefully we're helping, you know, the fauna of the peninsula too. So, full-blown chaparral, boy, if you look at habitat as steep and as rocky as this, and if uh, California natives can succeed, well, any slope you have in your garden, I think we can uh, handle it with the plants. <laughs> this is the uh, San Gabriel Mountains, uh, just north of Los Angeles area. Just an excellent example of uh, exposure in the communities that occur with the different aspects. Where, the, 
where the community uh, faces in regards to the position of the sun. For example, deeper soils in valleys uh, collect. We call that deposition. Heavier soils, often clays, popcorn flour and cream cups, two plants of the annual life form that occur at Edgewood County Park. Then a small streamlet with willows needing summer moisture to continue their uh, life cycle. On the northern aspect, this is in Mariposa County at about three, well, about 2,500 feet near Yosemite. Ponderosa Pine, a shady slope that especially in the uh, low light uh, months of winter stays quite moist. And of course you need moisture habitat to support tree growth, uh, to get that water up into the crown. And then south and southwestern and western shrub dominate communities. The community we're going to primarily look at, besides coastal scrub, for ideas to landscape our gardens, chaparral. So there's a number of adaptations of plants that uh, grow in chaparral. First of all, vertical leaf, in other words, facing a, a erect. Whoops. I think I uh, dropped my little mic. Excuse me. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good. Uh, vertical leaf arrangement. Uh, hairiness to one degree or another. This is the silver leaf uh, manzanita, and it grows near Bonnie Dune and also Ben Wellman. Of course, it is a manzanita with the fruits, the little apples, and it's actually a rare species that I don't know if it's used in the horticultural trade. It's about eight feet tall and can certainly be a good background plant. But a plant that also occurs, another manzanita, at Bonnie Dune is the Santa Cruz Mountain manzanita. But it's in a little different habitat at Bonnie Dune, which is uh, an ecological preserve. It's in the Santa Cruz Mountains, just north of Santa Cruz. And the leaves are horizontal. They're also quite green, and they're not so hairy. This is a plant more of sylvan or woodland situations. So a whole different strategy to cope. Woodlands, of course, have reduced light, so you want more leaf surface. A uh, plant we'll see at Edgewood uh, remarkably reduced leaf surface. The almost uh, fascicles or small clusters of needle-like foliage. This is the arrangement of the uh, foliage on chemise, probably one of our most drought-resistant uh, shrubs in California. And then another uh, trait, uh, dimorph dimorphic uh, leaves. California sagebrush uh, near uh, shallow soils at Edgewood, looking at the ridge, also looking at that state tree of Oregon. We know it always rains in Oregon, but there it is growing at Edgewood on a shady ridge top. Uh, California sagebrush has lush gray leaves in spring, but follow by growth towards May and June of slight side branches. The lush leaves drop and eventually oh, oh. The, uh, when the dimorphic process ends towards uh, August, when it's uh, we're really drought stressed, the plant can almost be termed drought deciduous. Almost no leaves or very thin leaves on this shrub. California sagebrush. And then, of course, chaparral and even coastal scrub have a very bad reputation because fires reoccur. But in your garden, do what the uh, U.S. Forest Service does on Cuesta Ridge. Lift them up. You know, prune the lower branches. Reveal those reddish trunks of the Obispo manzanita. Beautiful specimen throughout the year. They've done this in a fire break, but uh, certainly uh, this plant, eight 
to nine feet tall, spreading as widely, could be a fantastic specimen in our gardens. And it is available at plant sales. Which plant is it? It's uh, Archistaphylus abyspoensis, and it's uh, restricted to Monterey and San Luis Obispo counties, particularly the higher elevations of the Santa Lucia Mountains, which uh, are, you know, the coastal range between Monterey County and northern uh, Santa Barbara County. Speaking of our ranges, I'm on the San Francisco watershed west of Burlingame, and coastal scrub doesn't look very promising in November, and neither does the coastal scrub at uh, San Bruno Mountain in the background. Doesn't look promising, but get up there in spring and there'll be a whole host of plants that I've, I've either grown or seen in other people's gardens. Uh, the red crimson sage, sometimes also known as hummingbird sage. I've been growing it for 10 years. It does have underground rhizomes, so it spreads. I, uh, it is herbaceous, non-woody, so you can cut it back after flowering. Often you'll get a second uh, flowering, so it uh, makes kind of a ground cover, but a non-permanent ground cover. It works good in a mixture, just like you see here. Uh, in addition to uh, hummingbird sage, yarrow, uh, seaside daisy, three colorful plants in this seed, as well as our dwarf uh, coyote bush, it, and you know, it, it all fits with a nice outcrop. So hummingbird sage uh, gets that name, whether we're up at San... And locally, it's only found on San Bruno Mountain. It's absent from the rest of the Santa Cruz Mountains, an anomaly that uh, I can't quite understand because once you get into Monterey County, it becomes abundant. But it does grow inland, but as you get into warmer and drier, environments, uh, particularly San Luis and Santa Barbara counties, you need to give it uh, model light or afternoon shade. It'll grow under the coast live oaks. But in San Bruno Mountain and in Belmont, it grows in full sun. Another plant, uh, Golden Aster, uh, formerly known in the genus Chrysopsis, now Heterotheca, this is Golden Aster on San Bruno Mountain in flower like in July. Here it is, uh, a selection, Mound, not Mount, Mound San Bruno. We have it at the nursery. This is in August, and if I would deadhead the old flower heads, I could keep it flowering the entire summer in the fall. It is spread to about 12, 15 inches and above a plant I have in my uh, garden called uh, Dara's Choice. It's a, a hybrid, and I don't know if it was an intentional hybrid or a natural occurring. Dara Emery was the propagator at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, another great uh, resource to uh, see native plants. And he made this selection. It's a natural occurring hybrid between this species well, actually, there it is a little later in its development in my yard, uh, flowering. So you can see it's a mounding plant. Using a number of these shrubs, I'm kind of using it as a specimen, but you could use as low mounding relief. It's not quite as boring as a flat ground cover, like junipers. <laughs> but the uh, parents evidently are Salvia sonomaensis, the salvia sage, which is very low, even this globe lily, which occurs at Edgewood, uh, is towering over it. Now, salvia sonomaensis, I've seen natural occurring populations on Fremont Peak in San Benito County, where uh, Fremont faced the Mexicans at uh, Monterey with his uh, cannon, and also up at Cave Dale Road in Southern Sonoma County. But it skips the San, uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, but nevertheless, uh, the hybrid grows really well here. Well, the other parent is a shrub sage called black sage, which does grow uh, near San Jose, also uh, 
Big Basin, as a matter of fact, and uh, Mount Diablo. But it doesn't occur in our area, Black Sage, that is. So there's a carpet of Salvia sonomaensis in Sonoma County. It's uh, richly flowering, and of course, uh, it is perennial, so it'll have an all year presence. One of the great things about San Bruno are these natural rock gardens, uh, outcrops of gray wacky uh, sandstone of the Franciscan formation. We, we have coastal scrub, but it is very rich. Uh, a summer scene, like July, lizard's tail, uh, bush monkey flowers, stole flowers, seaside daisy, uh, pearly everlasting, individual grasses like uh, uh, Pacific reed grass, bunch grasses, very robust. Just an amazing environment. S seaside daisy, Ridgeron glaucus. Uh, I know there's a lot of selections. Wayne Roderick, who was the second director at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden, there's a Ridgeron Glaucus, a WR, which is a nice mounting plant. It, uh, WR, of course, sounds for Wayne Roderick. He made the selection. He made uh, numerous selections. Uh, so I'm not growing lizard tail, but I am growing the common yarrow of uh, Achillea millifolium. It occurs at Edgewood. It occurs at San Bruno Mountain throughout much of the state. In fact, it's almost cosmopolitan because it also occurs in uh, Europe, across much of North America, very widespread. It does spread uh, by underground routes. Uh, in California, in a drier habitat, it'll go dormant in summer or form spent blossoms, spent stems. But up at San Bruno, it uh, flowers into much of the summer. And if it does go dormant, you can actually mow it and use it as a small ground cover. Can we always the yellow flower in that last? Well, that, uh, do you know uh, lizard tail? Mm -hmm. uh, Area phyllum staccatifolium. Uh, at Edgewood, and we'll probably see the plant uh, on the field trip on uh, Saturday, we have golden yarrow. Uh, Area phyllum confertiflorum, a uh, relative. It actually is uh, found in more warmer and drier environments. Lizard tail did occur at Edgewood, but that was that plant that actually died when the cover was removed, meaning the shade. It was just too warm and dry at Edgewood. Marnadella, or coyote mint, uh, sometimes also known as penny royal, especially the Sierra forms. Well, Mar Marnadella villosa is found with a variety of habitats, both chaparral and coastal scrub, and there's different forms. This is Velosa abispoensis. Uh, leaf shape as well as flower color uh, are some of the differences because on San Bruno Mountain, we have Velosa franciscana, which is a very wide triangular leaf, very hairy and thick, purple flowers. And at Edgewood, we have Velosa velosa with uh, more pinkish flowers and thin leaves, just a mounding, I'd call it a subscrub, barely woody, but I have uh, in my yard, it's spread about as much as this podium, 24 inches, and with an occasional once a month watering, it'll flower late into the summer. The Douglas Iris, I grow this in uh, Belmont, in fact, I'll show you uh, in my yard. See, is that focused? The point here is I can grow it in full sun. And uh, there's the old truck that got me around to all these sites. <laughs> it is now, of course, in the graveyard, but the uh, iris is still with me. And the Montero manzanita, as well as the Fort Bragg manzanita. I think you can see I like manzanitas. But they uh, have a lot of potential different uh, sizes, shapes, textures. Boy, just a wealth of material for the plant garden. Now here's a situation that you have to experience to uh, 
there, I can operate the remote. Yeah. You have to experience. So I have this in my yard. It's California Bobberry, seen here growing in the coastal scrub at San Bruno Mountain. And let's look at the closer. Notice the uh, sharp spines on the leaves. Although the uh, flowers are attractive, the evergreen habit is attractive, the new red, reddish growth is very attractive. It can make a great barrier plant because it is spiny. Well, the thing is, I had it planted right near my iris, and the leaves take forever to uh, break down. In other words, those spines stay intact as much as a year later, and ouch! <laughs> well, that is one plan I eliminated. Uh, if you need to do division, like iris, every three years to keep it healthy and flowering well, you need to space them out and divide them. And then what you could do, too, is give uh, the discards or even the good plants to your friends. Uh, that's a Berberus pinata. I might mention uh, the state flower of Oregon is uh, Berberus aquifolium. It's a Berberus, the barberry, that is uh, more tolerant of uh, shade than our California barberry. But both have that feature of uh, prickles on the leaves. Of course, that makes them very resistant if you have a deer problem. <laughs> then I mentioned the uh, dwarf uh, coyote brush. You know, uh, plant more for utility because it doesn't flower very well. And there are selections, uh, one called Twin Peaks, one and two, as well as one from near uh, Pigeon Point. And genetically, they always remain prostrate. So they're useful for covering large areas for erosion control uh, ground covers. But in the native habitat, how about this? These little spikes, that's the great thing. Natives in the native habitat allow all kinds of surprises. That's a native orchid, a native rain orchid. The elegant rain orchid. Here seen at Pebble Beach, just south of uh, Pescadero State Beach Complex, along the San Mateo Coast. And then ground cover manzanitas, part of coastal scrub. Uh, Archistophilus uva ursi, better known as bearberry manzanita is uh, found throughout the world. We call it circumpolar. It grows in Siberia, mountains of Japan, Colorado Rockies, the New Jersey Pine Barrens, and the only location in the Santa Cruz Mountains, on um, San Bruno Mountain. And there's a particularly nice form that Arthur uh, Menzies of Striving Arboretum made uh, cuttings and named a selection and called it miniature due to these small, roundish leaves. And that's occasionally available in trades. And I just bought one at our uh, plant sale at Hidden Villa, which uh, our Santa Clara Valley chapter conducts. I haven't planted it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. In San Bruno Mountain, it just drains, drapes over a rocky slope and spreads five to six feet. And it hugs the ground. Boy, beautiful. San Bruno Mountain, uh, most of these plants have been perennials, subshrubs, or ground covers. But just looking at one shrub, blue blossom. Now I have a form of it, but mine is not blue, it is white. And it takes up most of my yard uh, currently. It's uh, called Snow Flory, uh, Ceanothus uh, physiflorus. The blue forms, of course, are dominant in nature in a variety of habitats in the Santa Cruz Mountains, as well as far to the north and south. This is San Bruno Mountain, of course, towards San Francisco. Well, mine is actually up to 12 feet wide now, but it's a beautiful white flowered form. It is evergreen. And as summer uh, draws upon San Bruno Mountain, we have our uh, coast buckwheat. And at Edgewood, we have a very closely related species, the naked stem buckwheat. But it will not have as many flowering stems as the coast buckwheat, Ariognum latifolium. Uh, this is on San Bruno Mountain, flowering at the same time as Farewell to Spring, the pink flower, in a quarry with uh, one of our uh, native uh, succulents beyond. 
really out of focus, uh, sedum or stone crop. Just wonderful habitats up San Bruno. Then uh, let's move on to chaparral. But first, we're going to visit maritime chaparral. It occurs under most of the conditions that occur with coastal scrub. A lot of fog, a lot of wind, but cool summer days and much abundant moisture due to the uh, marine influence. Well, here I am at uh, Morro Bay. Now, one big difference for maritime chaparral, the plants like here we see the Morro Manzanita above uh, to the south of Morro Bay actually occur on sand and sandstone, very coarse sandstones. Generally these substrates are somewhat acidic, very unusual in coastal environments. So we often don't have complexes, dune complexes like this, at least that aren't developed. Although the actual dunes that are moving between the Pacific Ocean and the bay are not habitat. These sands are stabilized. There is a distinction. In the Monterey area, we also have stabilized sands, uh, particularly on Fort Ord Military Reservation, or formerly. The uh, Lester Roundtree was a pioneer horticulturalist. Uh, she, didn't, she lived 100 years old, and she was the first honorary president for CMPS and passed away in 18, 1979. So she was a pioneer seed collector. And in those days, in the 20s, 30s, as a woman going out alone, uh, must have been unheard of. But she traveled the states collecting seeds for her business and has a book called Hardy Californians that recounts her seed collecting uh, trips from the deserts to the high Sierra. Well, the blue plant, the Monterey Bay uh, Ceanothus rigidus, she collected a white form way back probably in the 20s and 30s. It's called uh, Snowball. I have it in my yard and it's still in the trade. That, uh, you know, the white form is, of course, uh, more unique, but it's particularly striking. I mean, this uh, bluish lavender form is, well, kind of washed out. Uh, adjacent is a specialized manzanita to the right, the dune manzanita, uh, Archistaphylus pumila. Uh, another manzanita to the maritime chaparral is the little sir manzanita found about 30 miles south of Monterey, uh, near the vicinity of the Little Sur River. I have two forms in my garden. I have Carmel Sur and another one appropriately called Little Sur. One is mounding to about uh, two feet, and the other is a uh, prostrate ground cover. Uh, you can see the strawberry, that's the beet strawberry, Fadera chiloensis, which in addition makes a nice uh, small scale ground cover also grows at San Bruno Mountain. But this would be uh, another choice, especially if you had sandy soils, as an alternative ground cover to bearberry manzanita. And then heading further south, still maritime chaparral, the maritime Ceanothus, only found uh, near the Hearst property near San Simeon, Ceanothus uh, maritimus. Another mounding plant, but with upright uh, stems and very striking uh, floral. And if you could get a, a white form, or this is sort of a pale lavender, but that's where selections come in, looking for superior examples of our natives. So coastal scrub, as mentioned, has very strong wood, winds and generally an absence of trees. So you don't worry about shade. Uh, that's the uh, California bay tree that's uh, windshorn in Marin County. But before we look at plants of the chaparral and proceed to the last part of our program, we want to look at what I call, what is known as coastal sage scrub, a counterpart of Northern California's North Coast scrub, or mixed coastal scrub, this is in the Santa Monica Mountains, and 
species of the genus Salvia, the true sages, are abundant in this community. In addition, the uh, larger green shrub that's mounding is Laurel Sumac, only found in Southern California. It could be a little frost sensitive, but uh, very nice, clean looking uh, foliage plant with uh, flowers and panicles that occur in July. Anyway, this is all getting out of focus now. Anyway, uh, just uh, one of the nice things, California native plants always have a season or without our cooperation, without our gardening skills, that have kind of a season where they're unkempt or untidy. This is one plant and the plant, you really have to do uh, hardly any pruning, just a, a mounding plant. It would make a great uh, background plant uh, for gardens. Uh, nice evergreen throughout the year. It still has interest, followed by uh, berries. In fact, uh, I don't have a shot of the berry formation, but the rich panicles. A relative is Rus ovega. Now, both these plants are uh, found in the cashew family. Uh, this is sugar brush, and the fruit evidently uh, is quite sweet. Just lustrous green thick leaves that uh, don't seem to turn brown. They just drop green, and hence the tidy appearance. These shrubs both can attain uh, oh, heights of up to 18 feet, so that's why I would uh, use them more for background screen plants. So somehow it got off sequence. It's uh, focusing but changing. Well, anyway, the, uh, so it may need to be focused up there. This is uh, the, uh, what the coastal sage scrub looks like at the base of the San Gabriel Mountain. And I believe this one is white sage, Salvia apiana. Now all these sages are for good, hot, arid environments. In fact, the gray foliage reflects light. Also the spacing, not as dense as the uh, dense chaparral. Often drug deciduous, but a number of features that makes them quite attractive. For example, uh, white sage, is uh, most sages have flowers and whorls or verticils. The white sage, they're in the axils of the uh, flowering stem. And the stems, the plant's only about a foot to two feet high, a little mounting plant. But the flowering stems can go up to five feet. And of course, you would trim them back. But if uh, flowers in the summer, could be a very bold specimen. Purple sage, uh, leucophila. Is another uh, very attractive, both in leaf and flower. And of course, it's more typical of our California sage in worlds, and actually could be uh, much more richly adorned with flowers than this shop. It's just starting to flower. And then Cleveland sage. In fact, where purple sage and Cleveland sage, which is found in San Diego County, Purple sage is found between Monterey County and uh, Orange County. Where they come in contact, there's a natural occurring hybrid that has been selected uh, by Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, Allen Chicory, which uh, is still in the trade. It was a quite old selection, kind of reminiscent of uh, the snowball Cianothus that I spoke of. Then often associated with the sages, is California buckwheat. Now the great thing about these is we often think of spring as being the glorious time to have our native gardens. In fact, you know, the native garden tour uh, occurs in April. And certainly that is the great time to see our uh, flora at its best. But how about all these exceptions? The California buckwheat in August. I have a shot with Carolyn. <laughs> After one of our uh, habitats. This is an edgewood. And, God, for much of the summer, it's just a two foot high, four foot wide mound 
of uh, densely uh, white flowered uh, stems. California buckwheat. Now, the one thing about it, though, uh, does attract bees. It's a great honey plant. So you may not want to situate this near a patio. The uh, buckwheats are uh, come in a variety of forms. A uh, certain amount come in shrub form as these gray mounding plants. That's uh, the Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, restricted in the world to Santa Cruz Island, maybe some of the adjacent uh, Channel Islands off the coast of Santa Barbara. But it's another buckwheat that will uh, flower uh, throughout the summer, seeing that uh, I'm using it kind of as a foundation plant against uh, my wall. This was very early on. I even had my lawn in. Pre. <laughs> but I got the message. <laughs> and another buckwheat that I have that I know the chapter sells. Uh, the saffron uh, flower buckwheat, Eriognum crocatum. It's restricted in the world to the north base of the uh, Santa Monica Mountains on volcanoes. It uh, seeds once in a while in my yard. I've got a little teeny uh, pup right now in my yard. But another plant that flowers in the summer. So you can create, what we can do with these buckwheats is have small scale plants for our peninsula gardens, that have additional interest during our summers. That's the point. When we look at buckwheats. And then, locally, we don't have too many selections made from our local plants. Uh, certainly, there's good examples, but horticulturally, we've been somewhat absent. Except uh, Yerba Buena Nursery did make a selection of this plant called the Northern Bush Mallow, seen here at Edgewood. Uh, these plants actually died in a fire, but Eleanor, I think her last name was Perry of Yerba Buena, made a cutting, and now the selection is now known as Edgewood. Well, this is a relative of the hollyhocks and wonderful flowers. This is actually not the Edgewood uh, specimen, but uh, Jones's bush mallow from near Paso Robles. Just beautiful plants that uh, will lose their leaves towards the end of summer. Also, very rapid growth rates. Also, of course, very drought resistant with the hairy gray leaves. But with these rapid growth rates, a relatively short lifespan. So how you can use them, you know, manzanitas are slower in the environment. How about using these as early uh, garden fillers to, uh, you know, quickly get bloom, get appearance in the first couple of years, and then if they die, the manzanitas and other desirable shrubs fill in. We found at Edgewood, the colony after a, a fire in 1992, that being outcompeted by California sagebrush. And then monkey flowers. I mentioned that uh, on our coast, uh, some of them bloom all year round. Now, how about a scene like this in the wild? Speaking of hybridization, and uh, mixing. Well, the Jepson Manual of 1993 lumped them all in a single species, the uh, Mimulus orientaicus, sticky monkey flower. But uh, formerly, some of these had other names that were recognized. The author in the 93 manual didn't recognize the variation, so they were no longer valid species. But we've got Longiflorus, maybe. Uh, Fleming Eye, the red, and there's shades, natural hybrids. This is near uh, Palomar, Mar uh, Palomar Mountain, uh, San Diego County, uh, the home of the telescope. From the pinnacles becomes uh, a formerly recognized species. Mimulus bifidus, and boy, much different in appearance, the flowers, than our Edgewood sticky monkey flower and quite a bit more attractive. Londoflorus, again, uh, found near uh, La Panza Range, east of uh, Paso Robles, with the, uh, the Penstemon, or Techiella cordifolia, the, uh, which is, in fact, I forget the common name of that. I'm a miss. But anyway, this is a 
Does everyone know penstemons? Mm -hmm. Boy, penstemon is the largest genus, entirely restricted to North America, number of species. Over 200 different types in North America, from the eastern United States to, uh, they only cover North America. But the techiellas are basically the shrub penstemons. There's other technical differences. They used to be known as penstemon. Cordifolius implies heart leaf uh, penstemon, if we translate literally. But it is a scandent, or you know, a sprawling uh, shrub. It can be used with maybe a fence or a wall to, to hang over. Rich uh, flowers. And with the, uh, that was in uh, Reservoir Canyon in San Luis Obispo. And also in San Luis Obispo, this is off the Cal Poly campus, in another site of a good arboretum, the Leaning Pine Arboretum on campus. This is the Chalk Dudleya. And I have a little area set aside in Belmont, another little mound, only a foot high, that I've been successful to grow uh, Dudleyas, live forevers. These are native succulents with great variety. There's actual native occurring Dudleyas on uh, San Bruno Mountain, as well as Castle Rock State Park. This one is found from about San Luis County in the Baja, California. A real robust uh, specimen with the rosettes, the basal uh, leaves, alone is a striking addition to our garden. Now this is the canyon Dudleya. It occurs in our area. Uh, not in the immediate, but in the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, Dudleya Simosa. Again, interesting, but much shorter flowering stems. So this is more of a rock garden plant, or a small scale plant, uh, maybe in a perennial border, that has, of course, a gravel mulch. We don't want to splash fungal uh, spores on it. So Edgewood, where our walk will take place? We'll see this scene. This may have been in August. But slope exposure, even at Edgewood, on the left, south facing, dominated by chemise. On the right, a chaparral too, but with a different dominant. The leather oak, shown with the flowering tackens, which we possibly will see Saturday. Uh, a shrub oak, that could be another a great background plant uh, adapted to poor soils. So if you had thin soils, rocky soils, leather oak. <coughs> Corcus dorata, and of course very drought resistant. Uh, the leaves are shaped kind of convex, which reduces transpiration. Buckbrush also grows on that very same trail. I couldn't find my slide. Bart O'Brien, a uh, former chapter president who uh, works at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, lived in San Antonio Canyon. And this scene is what he would drive by in March. This is uh, the hoary leaf sea enough. It's very similar to uh, our buck brush that occurs at Edgewood. It's a white flowered uh, shrub, maybe six, eight feet, well, <coughs> five feet tall, seven feet wide or so. But uh, the buck brushes are more from the chaparral compared to the wild lilacs like blue blossom that are found more in coastal scrub or woodland environments. So these are truly chaparral plants. Now, uh, a chaparral plant of the Santa Cruz Mountains is the uh, Ceanothus papillosus, the wart leaf Ceanothus, and I may have this upside down. But it'll be uh, more reminiscent of the wild lilac type, the blue flower. Selections as far as I know, haven't been made, but it is apparent that a uh, number of named forms in the trade. And speaking of, uh, you know, variation in nature and making uh, selections, this is the white leaf manzanita, a rich pink flowering specimen on the right, and kind of a nondescript white on the left. So white leaf manzanita loves it hot and dry and extends all the way from Kern County, even into Southern Oregon. Locally, we have a manzanita with bluish uh, gray foliage. Also, uh, 
the Elmo Coast Silk Tassel. So this is flowering in January, St. Joseph's uh, Open Space Preserve near Lost Adams. The plant that's occurring there is Big Berry Manzanita. But actually, I have grown it in Belmont, uh, right along El Camino Real, a former uh, site we called North Entry. It had a sign welcoming people into the north part of uh, Belmont with uh, Vermont the Dinger in behind. <coughs> so Big Berry Manzanita. And of course, it has amongst the largest fruits in the genus. And it's a full shrub size uh, manzanita. Vertical leaves again. And of course, Montadendron, uh, seen here at the base, the north base of the San Gabriel Mountains, uh, is a huge plant, probably way too big for most of our suburban gardens. As much as 25 feet wide and 15 feet tall, but if you've ever seen anything packed with, you know, bright yellow flowers, Montadendron. Uh, our journal is called Fremontia. It's also known as flannel bush, and there is a form from El Dorado County, a Fremontodendron californicum subspecies decumbens, that only has, uh, well, I've seen it up there with forms kind of mounding up to only three feet tall. And there are hybrids, and I couldn't find my slide that I uh, took of the El Dorado flannel bush. Much better choice for our gardens than the California. And a number of selections. One um, farm hill road, as you enter 280 southbound, is called California Glory. So Chemise is much maligned in the foreground of the rose family, but it's a nostoma fasciculatum, referring to the fascicles, the arrangement of the leaves and clusters. But behind, in Riverside County, the nostoma sparsifolia, red shanks. And in the Santa Monica Mountains, in late July or early August, prune this up, I think you could have a great specimen plant. It's also known as ribbonwood. Gets up to uh, 15 feet tall, almost uh, gives a tropical appearance because of its uh, stringy wood. It uh, does grow north, at least to Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo County, and would be quite hardy in our area. Very drought resistant and rich flowering, another summer choice. It also, uh, sparsifolium, folium, refers to the sparse or few leaves along the stems. But again, uh, rose family, clusters of white flowers and panicles. And then this is right at Edgewood Park, a scene we might see if we, if there is interest on the walk. Uh, Coast Silk Castle. Beautiful plant. I have that. Uh, now it's up to the peak of my roof, 15 feet tall. So many of these chaparral plants, you de do need room for them to reach their fullest development and appreciate their, uh, you know, worthy characteristics. This is an alternate, alternately uh, heavy flowering, weak flowering uh, shrub. Mine is timed with Edgewood. This year it's fantastic. Some years it seems to be alternately bearing heavy and weak. Some years it only have a few. This is the male form, the cactus. Some years there will only be a few cactus. And then also these great years. Meanwhile, it is evergreen with uh, rich uh, green leaves, undulate, and very hairy on the undersurface. Quite rough. Bush poppy. Now that's one of the ones I've actually had difficulty with in my heavy clay soils. And you can see there's growing on a rocky, almost vertical bank. So God, who is ever going to garden in that situation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the flowers are great. And uh, there's a book uh, from Rancho Santa Ana, California Shrubs for the Garden by Lee Lentz and John Durley. They mention this God, when it's in flower, it's hard to be. But many of us kill it. A better form of it is the subspecies Hartfordii from the Santa Cruz Mountains. It is much more tolerant of uh, summer water, also cooler temperatures, 
and it seems to be more garden worthy. That's Hartford's uh, Bushmallow. Can you rent Santa Cruz Island? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got to spend a week there uh, monitoring purple needle grass. <laughs> Not uh, a boring thing at all. <laughs> a week, you know, you never, that's when it was privately owned too. The Nature Conservancy had just uh, actually uh, obtained part of it. Now it's part of the Nature Conservancy and National Park Service, Channel Islands National Park. But there's uh, Hartford's bush poppy with larger leaves, but also kind of that glaucous uh, bluish green cast. Very attractive, especially set off with the yellow flowers. Seems like the flowers are also larger. And then uh, that plant I showed that was in the swale, very much the wrong location. Uh, Woolly blue curls, a little shrub up to about three to four feet tall. It only spreads about two feet. Here's seen with uh, chaparral pea, which uh, we're not going to see flowering on the Clarkey Trail, but does occur at Edgewood. That has the magenta flowers. Uh, Willy blue curls, if you can give it good drainage, is a very attractive shrub. With the elongated stamens forming the so-called curl, it's evergreen. And of course, is frequent in the chaparral from Again, Monterey County, down into Baja, Riverside, San Diego. So a lot of these come from the south coastal ranges. This one is at Edgewood. Rarely sets fruit. Uh, the magenta blossoms are very attractive, but it's very kind of spiny. Unless you really want to grow it as a barrier plant, it's kind of like that California bogberry. Look at it at a distance. We'll get to see it. We'll see what you think on Saturday, if you attend. Uh, Chaparral P, uh, Cacaringia montana, and maybe with Arvin we'll uh, print a list of these plants. Uh, they're all, Yerba Buena has had Chaparral P for sale. I don't believe the chapter ever has. It probably wouldn't be a big seller. We need to finance the chapter activities. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we skipped one because we may see this in flower, Saturday, chaparral current. Sometimes at Edgewood, it actually flowers as early as uh, November. And it actually flowers on wood growth produced the uh, previous year at the end of uh, the growing season, which would have been May 2010, and quickly bursts into bloom with the onset of winter rains. Chaparral current, uh, the genus Ribes. Of course, we had pink flowering. We will see a current. Uh, and a, a gooseberry. This is a gooseberry. Gooseberries have thorns. At Edgewood, we'll see the hillside gooseberry, Ribes californica. Not nearly as attractive as Ribes speciosum, the fuchsia flower gooseberry. Hummingbirds love this one. And then, as we kind of wind down, some attractive fillers in our chaparral garden. Uh, we mentioned the genus Penstemon. There's the Kekiellas, are somewhat woody, but most of the genus that's been retained in the genus Penstemon are non-woody or herbaceous. This is uh, Grinnell's Penstemon from the South Coast Ranges. Sometimes they're known as beard tongue. And you can see that staminoid, which is a sterile stamen with the hairs looking somewhat like a bearded tongue. The uh, scarlet bugler, Penstemon centranthifolius, is found uh, from Lake County through the Hamilton Range, east of our area. The pinnacles, down into uh, Southern California. And scenes like this, you can see how they grow. Uh, they're non-woody, but they grow in openings in the chaparral, in full light. Scarlet bugler, with its tubular flowers. You know, a variety of color forms we can mix and match. Uh, there's yellow ones. Uh, a lot of them are blue, of course. In fact, uh, one from the west side of the Mount Hamilton Range, including the Santa Cruz Mountains, Penstemon heterophyllis, has a selection called Blue Better. 
And then, uh, totally as we're winding down, if we have chaparral, what do we have that uh, we might grow to add some seasonal interest? How about weeds? Mariposa lily, uh, Calicordus weedii. Um, well, we have mariposas at Edgewood, but this is in Riverside. And there it is, right in the heart of the chaparral. Quite attractive, quite unusual, especially attractive to that pollinator, probably a little wasp. Richly colored. You know, we have probably uh, 20 different species of mariposas and two at Edgewood, I'll, I'll show you now. Whether they're available, well, sometimes they are because we have uh, one woman, Sally Casey, that grows bulbs. These are known as geophytes. They'll, uh, well, the great thing about weeds, mariposa, is that it actually delays flowering into summer where uh, many of the mariposas flower earlier, more springtime. Uh, Blumeria. Uh, golden stars. That's found at the pinnacles. And uh, I know Sally has had bulbs of it, Bomeria corsia. It uh, is a nice small onion-like plant that uh, you can, you know, put in a little niche along a wall for close inspection. In fact, at Edgewood we have the dwarf brodea, maybe more of a subject of a tray or uh, a small rock garden. Or Bordea, Bordea terrestris, uh, it actually has or lacks an above ground stem. And then I mentioned uh, this is not the Mariposa that occurs at Edgewood, but we have one similar. This is Calicordus venustus. This form was from the Pinnacles and very rich uh, array of colors. This is the one actually at Edgewood, but I didn't photograph it at Edgewood. The clay-loving mariposa, Calicordus argillosus. I actually found this one on the way to the pinnacles. So our south coast range is a great plant hunting territory. Towards the pinnacles, Carrizo Plains, arid environments. Because rainfall is problematic in the south coast ranges, you can have very poor years where you don't see good stands of these mariposas or flowering plants in general. A couple annuals that, uh, from the south coast ranges that do well in Kern County that I've grown in my garden and now they seed every year, and I just let them come up wherever they come up, uh, is the tansy leaf facilia at the base, has long exterted salmons, quite attractive, and, but it doesn't take over. I had like three plants last year, now I have eight, maybe eventually. But then I have competition because I have it growing with uh, Farewell to Spring, Quartia. <laughs> uh, another facilia is Perry's, Facilia Perry, Monterey County down to Baja, and a rich uh, bluish violet. Again, these are uh, plants adapted to the chaparral and rocky or well drained substrates, which chaparral generally occupies. Now, of course, California has wetlands, but that would, meadows, but those would be subjects of an additional uh, discussion. I mentioned clarkias. Uh, we've got the reddish, the wine cup clarkia, which also occurs at Edgewood. And you know, uh, taxonomy, the classification of uh, native plants, or plants worldwide, how about these two clarkias? There's such subtle features. The buds in the wine cup are erect. Clarkia deflexa, they're drooping. And you need to observe that feature. So you need to uh, come in on the flowering sequence to determine which Clarkia it is. In general, they're known as uh, Farewell to Spring because they do flower towards the end of our spring. I've even seen them up San Bruno Mountain. In, even at Edgewood in rainy years with late rain and spring, into uh, August, better known as Summer's Darling, if they're occurring at that time of year. So a little seasonal interest in summer, uh, California goldenrod, which occurs, the yellow plant. It's a rhizomatous perennial that you just trim back after the flowers are spent. 
He forms a green mat. And California fuchsia for fall flowering uh, color in a garden. Grayer foliage, nice contrast with the scarlet flowers. Hummingbirds on their southward migration are very dependent on this species in the wild and will visit it in your garden. Forms more or less a ground cover. Does go slightly dormant in winter. You can you know, turn it back, but quickly emerges. It doesn't flower. It actually must be a short daily plant because it doesn't even start flowering until late uh, July into August. And then how about a challenge? A plant of the Southern California chaparral. And I wonder if anyone has been successful. How about this larkspur with the long red spikes of flowers? Actually, a racine. Delphinium cardinale gets up to four to five feet tall. I've never even seen it available, so I've never attempted to grow it. But I don't even think uh, it occurs at the, the botanic gardens. I think it's really quite difficult. But man, Ken, what a Annie Daniels. She's growing it. Yes, She's yes. a wizard, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll have to mention it. I, I haven't been to her uh, nursery. It's in Richmond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for you uh, fictionados, learn where Annie's annuals. You can get a lot of great uh, California plant forms. And then one I like, and I saw this at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. It also grows in the Channel Islands as well as in the San Diego County, is summer holly. But it's not a holly. It's not a holly. Of course, uh, our toyon is sometimes known as California holly, which isn't a holly either. It's of the rose family. This is of the heather family. It's actually a relative of the madrone. But unlike the madrone, it doesn't attain tree stature. It's more of a large shrub, just covered in these urn-shaped flowers and it has a fruit, just like the madrone. And it uh, can grow in Northern California. Uh, I have seen it at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden. Summer holly, Camarostaphylis Carmar diversifolia. This one, I definitely want to get it somehow. So Jean, our head nursery person's here. Are we growing any of it? Well, we did. We did? And there were no takers? Oh, that's one of the problems. Availability. <laughs> so as we look at two last slides, or maybe three, as we look at the uh, San Bruno Mountain Manzanita occurring on Manzanita Dyke, a special little uh, knoll that you can look on from the summit parking lot, the prostrate form, an extremely interesting growth pattern. It grows in solid rock, and uh, I grew it in my garden and it promptly died due to a fungal leaf disease. So unless you have a gravel mulch, uh, you're probably not going to be successful. But the real point is, do you realize there was a scheme in the 1960s to uh, actually bulldoze a third of the San Bruno Mountain and use it for bay fill, particularly the so-called Seven Crossing, which would have been a bridge to San Leandro? In San Bruno Mountain Manzanita, the only place in the world that occurs is on that summit. And we would have lost the entire species. And as we look at this final scene, towards San Luis Obispo and the San Lucia range and the mosaic of plant communities, you know, uh, California Native Plant Society is dedicated Although it's a challenge to grow them, a greater challenge may be to preserve, you know, our rich diversity of native plants with the increasing uh, human population and development and uh, altering native plant communities with invasive species. So it is the mission of the Native Plant Society not only to inform people through education, but to preserve native plants in their natural occurring habitats. And for that, uh, I am certainly grateful. Uh, thank you. Um, we can take about five minutes of questions if you like, and then we'll have to clear out. Um, that's kind of one of the time.
time here. But I do have so one question. Right now. Um, no, we have a little bit of flexibility here, right? Oh. Okay. Okay. So, um, so if you want to go ahead and ask questions, I also want to just tell you that, that we do have six of these um, uh, talks where we are talking about plant communities like this and a, uh, a, a walk afterwards in that plant community uh, that you know, the same week. And so I um, just want to let you cue into that. But anyway, I'll give you Ken again his question. Okay. Any uh, questions from the audience? Ken, what's going on at Edgewood tomorrow? We oh, about that? well, we have the walk on Saturday. But do you realize every Friday, almost throughout the year, there's a habitat restoration program that uh, was founded by Ellie Hess. And with Ellie, uh, Bob Young sitting right next to you is right on her shoulder in 1989, every Friday ever since, and it's controlled the number of invasives in the very sensitive uh, habitats. We uh, have an email list that informs those participants on a weekly basis where we'll meet, and we meet 9 o'clock. We usually work to 1, but some people come uh, later because they know where we're going to meet because of the email list. Uh, you can arrive when convenient and leave when convenient. But it gives you an excellent opportunity to see native plants in their natural occurring habitats. That's how we discovered uh, lizard tail at Edgewood. Uh, it was unknown until we found that plant. Then it quickly died. And we discovered it mapping yellow star thistle. We wouldn't even have been out at that time of year if we weren't out there for habitat restoration. So. You know, if you have time and uh, this subject intrigues you, get involved in a number of ways. You know, every Wednesday we have opportunities at our Hidden Villa Nursery to work on propagation. And that is between 12 and 3. Uh, Jean could give more details. We have a new uh, shade cloth to protect plants, compliment her husband sitting next to her, Dave, just newly constructed. And we do a lot of good things. And it's fun. <laughs> and it's an opportunity. So, Jean. You want to give the Edgewood uh, website or email? Well, address? let's see. I wonder if. Well, you know, okay, there's a bunch of links. Like, John Allen actually does it, and you got to go to friendsofedgewood.org in a link. Uh, it's probably Weeding, Edgewood. But John Allen, uh, weekly, one of our uh, Friday members, he's the actual person, and we don't give his email out to the public. You have to be interested, in other words. <laughs> in other words, we guard our... In fact, I think the chapter guards their email list, in addition. Oh, Carolyn. So on these plants that you grow, you kind of mentioned something about watering. So. Can you tell us a little bit about the watering requirements of these plants? Can you just tell them? Well, okay. Here's a, a proper scenario for me that I didn't follow with the uh, Maharo Manzanita. I would like to buy them at the fall plant sale. Uh, Berkeley has a fall plant sale. Tilden does. Uh, our chapter does. Now you can, well, Tilden also has a spring sale in April. It's not as good a time in April to establish them. If you can establish plants in the cool season of the year where there's a low evaporation, low transpiration, low sun angle, root growth is kind of primed to uh, speed up in early spring. Meanwhile, uh, above ground growth is retarded somewhat. So you've got plants that are adapting to the environment they're living in they're being established. So with that, uh, the first year, you're going to probably have to monitor them and maybe, depending on the plant, from Montodendron, you almost, from day one, don't want to water. Uh, another plant would be woolly blue curls. You can kill them. But plants like uh, the monkey flowers, the uh, manzanitas, you might want to water them weekly or at least monitor it. Like, I live, live in Belmont, you know, we get pulses of uh, marine influence, and we'll have overcasts. And at that time, that's actually a good time to water. 
because you get le less evaporation this right in the summer. Uh, overcast sometimes all day in West Belmont. The reason it's a good time, the fungal uh, diseases aren't as active that attack the stems. It's more like winter temperatures. You know, our native plants can take tons of water in winter. You know, a sudden, not sudden oak death, but uh, oak root fungus is active when we water our oaks in summer. It's not active uh, in winter, although it's present. It's the cool temperatures. So it's during those periods. Well, year two, God, it might be every two weeks. You really do have to monitor your own situation. Do you have a clay soil that retains moisture, or do you have a rapid draining uh, sand? You know, case by case. But nevertheless, uh, this is a typical schedule. And you know what? Because I live in an urban neighborhood, I actually, except for the deadliest and some of the real drought resistant plants, I water the manzanitas once a month throughout the summer just to keep them in good form and to keep them uh, appearing well. And also, if I lived near the urban fringe, they would be uh, resistant to burning. That's what I would do once a month. And as long as you have fairly good drainage and you know, water them during these cool periods, you don't have a problem. It's uh, the site selection in the beginning. You know, I put that woolly blue curls in a slight swale that actually collected water. It didn't shed, hence the mound. So that's, and that's especially for chaparral plants. This isn't the case for meadows particularly, or other plant communities that uh, GWN will discuss at, uh, when's the next one? Um, I think the next one is, uh, and where? March. 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 And what's its subject? Valley and foothill uh, woodland. Ke Kevin Brandt is going to talk ah, about it. Yeah. Well, he'll be an excellent speaker, so. Well, Ken has been a super speaker. I really appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.